Hey, Dave the Train Guy from the Hobby Man by Hearns. Okay, today on Project TT. Yes, that's us. This is part two of on the layout build or how to build a layout. Okay, now on our last episode we were talking about our, the basics. So we covered off on carpentry. Go down to your big, big shed hardware store, buy some timber, get some pine framing, get a saw, get a cordless drill, some screws, and then you're off and running. Maybe a jigsaw, maybe a hammer, maybe some nails, yeah. Okay, so we've built our frame, you've got your, your surface covering done, we've got all that down, we've got that pinned down, we've done our track plan, we've got all that worked out, we want to have we want to have loops, we want to have sidings, we want to have passing loops, we want to have a station on it, we want a multiple rows, we want a big goods yard, whatever. So we've worked all that out. We've got our track. Yeah, we've bought enough and I bet you you'll probably still won't have the track you want. But nah. Such is life. So we're up and right to the stage we've clipped it all together. We've done all this run the trains see if it works yes it won't be pinned down it may move but let's just see if it everything get a piece of rolling stock test it make sure it all works next test all your power connections your contactivity because this is where it's going to get start it's to get a little bit serious and then we went on to we spoke about cutting underlay and we are using cork sheet the stuff here it's about three mil so it's nice and thin, and we cut it into strips, so we've got that lovely looking bell shoulder. We've done that. We've painted our rails. We wanted to kill off that natural, sort of bright nickel silver look that track has, and we've dry brushed our sleepers with an appropriate color, light gray, light, yeah, white dry brush it, like we said, okay. Now we're going to come to the track laying part. So this is where it all starts going up a gear. Now what I would suggest is only use minimal amount of track pins. Don't go crazy. You're not building a raw time battleship that has to have rivets and be secured or fastened in every little orifice, angle, whatever. So what I would suggest is the Pico track laying pins, SL14. Because these are nice and fine. We do not do not use big oversized chunky tacks. It's just going to distract from the whole lovely appearance. So like you said, you've weathered your track. It looks brilliant. Okay, now for our demonstration purposes. And I do believe with track pins, less is best. You probably need to use them just before a turnout, maybe in your curves to hold your curves down. But you, in my opinion, you don't you don't really need to go crazy with, and you probably don't need to, to nail down every little hole there is in your track. Okay, now you can't even see that. There we go, but it's probably actually even thin, thinner than a dressmaker's pin, and it's a lot shorter. There we go. All right, just to get, and with your set track, you'll also have tiny little holes. And like I mentioned in the last video, I think there's four holes. There. And you probably can't even see them, but they're that tiny. Right, so we'll position that up. Now there are other alternative ways of securing your track down. Sometimes some people would may believe in gluing it down with your cork or your underlay, but I think in this method that I'm showing you today, it's a little bit more controlled. Now I'm just using a pair of pliers. Four pins, four holes. Yeah, I know, I know I said don't put a pin into every hole, but this is just a demonstration video. 
Now, you can use a hammer, but it would only be a small one. It would be a fairly specialized looking little hammer like this. We do sell them here for model building. But the problem is you may hit the side. And if you do, you're gonna get a kink in your rail and your little wheels are gonna bow. They're gonna fall into that dip and they're gonna derail. If you're good, you can use the hammer. And it just so happens to be this one is just big enough to go between the rails. Maybe a, a, um, a nail punch could be appropriate if you think you're a bit clumsy. Or what I normally do, because I work in the larger scales most of the time, you can actually drive it in with a pair of pliers. And because it's essentially just going into cork, and a little bit of it's going into the timber below, you can usually just drive it home with a pair of pliers. And the other beauty of this too, you can pull them out if you bend them. And one of the beauties of using these little pins is that there's usually a, a big enough of a, of a head on top, a flat head, that will allow you to pull it out if need be. So if you do need to make an adjustment, or you do want to fit that extra turn out in, or you want to take it out, you can. And just with minimal amount of pressure, because these are nice and sharp, you can drive them in. And like I said, you can pull them out. Okay. Well, that's with only two track pins, so that's about all we need. And just be mindful of the fact too, you don't want to bend your track too much. It's, everything's going to be at a scale, so you don't need to have it really bolted down that firm, as long as it's firm. Because what's going to happen is we're going to do some balancing. And when the balance goes over, that'll help lock the track in. So really just think of track pins as a means to just to basically secure it in place, but it doesn't have to lock everything down. Again, and we'll just put our, our turnout back into place. Did that with our glasses. And with the turnout, I would be, again, be very careful around turnouts because they are delicate and they have got moving bits. You don't want to go thumping uh, nails into them all over the place. They do have a provision for a nail hole here and there, like you've got one here, one here, one here. I'd be inclined personally not to put too many in. I'd only probably put one or two in here and maybe don't even come near this, this part, this moving bit here just on the off chance you could damage it. And like I said before too, things like conductivity are important, so just be mindful of not to get paint and dirt and dust in there if you can help it. And just for the exercise, I will just put a pin or two into that turnout. Yeah, he's even found a little pinhole there, without even trying. Okay. If you decide to use a hammer, come and see us and get a small hammer. Do not buy anything from a hardware store, because unless you can find one this small. Because you're going to end up bang, banging and bending your track. And then it's going to cost you more money because you're going to have to come down and buy a replacement. Turn out. That's nice and secure. Right. Ballast. Now, what is ballast? Uh, for the uninitiated, it's crushed rock. Now, I think the old 
uh, the old requirement was for a piece of rock about the, probably about the size of what you could probably couple in your hand or what a, a track worker could put in his mouth. I think that's a bit weird actually. But what it does in real life, it holds the track in place, stops it from vibrating and moving around. And you'll find too on main lines, if you ever, when you do see a, a railway uh, line, if you go, some, if you travel by train or you just happen to see it on the side of the road or whatever, you'll find the higher the ballast is usually uh, a sign that that, that particular piece of track is used for high speed trains where or heavy freight trains where there's going to be a lot of up and down thumping movement, a lot of sideways movement. So you find uh, on mainline railways they'll have a lot of ballast to hold it in place. And for our flying Scotsman, which would have been a high speed passenger train, it would have been going over a very heavily ballasted track. You find probably on your little rural branch lines they would have less ballast because the speeds weren't as high and the rail poundage was lower and also a lot of the time it was also came down to economics as to how much it would cost to build a railway line. So what we're going for today is a heavily ballast look so we've got that big heavy ballast shoulder along the side there. So that is ballast. Now if it's for TT I would suggest a fine grade ballast so that means the particles are really fine. So something that's used for N scale is going to be perfect for TT. You don't want, really want to go medium or coarse because that'll look like if it was to scale out, it would look like garden rocks on your track. And even the uninitiated amongst us would realize that you don't have big bouldery looking garden rocks along your railway line. It just doesn't happen. So to keep the, the whole effect going, I would honestly suggest using fine. Now the brand we sell here predominantly at hands in the hobby man is the Woodland Scenics range and you can either get it in a container about this size uh, which will cover 945 centimeters cubed so but it's still a lot so I think probably the most part one of these would probably do your layout build but on saying that I wouldn't suggest using just one color I would mix it up because yeah, like I said, nothing in real life is consistent. And it depends, you might be really particular about which railway in the world you're modeling, but if it's going to be English, I'd say a lot of the times it's probably going to be variations of greys. And there's no shortage of colors here. We've got quite a few colors. We've got light gray, we've got gray, we've got medium cinders, we would have brown, dark brown, so forth. So, and the other thing is you can always blend them too. And one thing you'll find in real life too is that uh, railway ballast doesn't usually stay clean for very long. It even gets dirty. So a light gray color would probably over time weather out to something more like a brownish color like that. Now you've got to remember, keep in consideration too, when trains come in out of stations or they go up and down hills, they're usually applying their brakes and the brakes are made out of iron. And when you have a, a metal brake shear against a railway wheel, it's going to grind, create dust and that dust is usually metal based and you'll have things like cinders from steam engines, uh, soot, dirt, everything. So another consideration, don't make it too uniform, just you can mix it up. Don't feel bad if you do because if you look at a layer that's all one colour, sometimes it doesn't look quite right. It looks a little bit like uh, Thomas the Tank Engine maybe. Perfect weld. But if you want a perfect weld, that's fine. On to the balancing. Now, this is something that is really, really, really handy. And it's from Pauses. It's a Backman brand. But they have a five pack tool uh, assortment kit. So it's everything you would need to build a layer. And it's got this rather little handy little device here for spreading your ballast. Now, it's a little cube. Uh, where are we? Just get a good image of it there. Yeah. Probably the illustration helps me more. It's a little cubic box with a little, like a slopey shaft in it. You fill it up with your crushed ballast and it, it's measured. So you would push it along your track, like so. Yeah, like so. You push that along your track. It's actually got little grooves on the bottom. 
where are we? Hopefully you can see that. There you go. You've got these little grooves on the side here. Or on the bottom, I should say. Not on the side. What's he talking about? Okay, you would slide that along. And that'll give you a measured... Um, a measured output of ballast. So, And the other beauty of using this product is that as you push it along, it'll clear the rails. So that's a device you can use. Very, very handy. But if you don't want to use it, uh, the other method is just to do it purely by hand. Uh, which is what we'll demonstrate. Now I seem to be leaking ballast everywhere at the moment. Let the magic begin, he says. Messy modeling, I love it. Now this is pure, this is a really good example of what I meant before about that little device there, little ballast spreader, which is available in TT, and I don't know of anybody else apart from ourselves who stock such a device. There we go. All right. Are you watching this? Now, probably ideally, when it comes to putting it between the sleepers, I would probably just rub it in like that now. In the perfect well, which makes sense to me, that's probably that effect there. You can just see the face of the sleepers and the ballast is down between them. Almost like, it's like, almost like grouting tiles would be probably a good example. Okay, we'll get a little bit more aggressive. I'm just simply getting at the wrongs. Now just remember, your wheels, your little flanges, run on the inside of the rail. So anything you put on the inside is going to, to a degree, is going to foul your wheels if you put too much of whatever it is. And this would be a good, a good case to maybe have some sort of a, a, a paintbrush. 38mm paintbrush or 25mm brush since we're doing TT. What sort of job is this where I can come to work and make this much mess and get paid for it? Okay. All right. Let's work with what we've got. Now remember, this is all dry at this stage. We may need a little bit more, believe it or not. We've got a lot, it's just not in the right spot. Now these little foam applicators are probably brilliant. And if I was to say, given one of these as a pe as opposed to a paintbrush, I would probably go for one of these. And I'm guessing you could probably find these in art stores or art supply centres if they sell uh, art supplies. Or I'm guessing even the craft section of hardware stores. Alright, so we'll try to get this tidied up a little bit. It's starting to look good, but we've still got a little bit too much cork exposed. Now, probably one thing I should mention too is, um, as you're getting more and more involved in this, into, into building your layout, start exerting the real world. Maybe just, you can go and 
have a look in books or magazines and it has images of it may not always necessarily be your favorite railway but uh, if you're a, a fan of the LMER London North Eastern Railway Company or London Midland Scottish maybe just have a look at some books and just just start making some observations about the uh, railway infrastructure um, just little things like where like the height of the ballast shoulders placement of signals what style of tunnel mouth do they use with a tunnel mouth brick or stone all those sort of things and believe me as you move along with this hobby you'll become actually more aware of these things all right so we'll put a little bit more on here always best to do it in stages because the more we put down the more we're going to try to move around and get rid of so just keep it manageable who knows the final ring the other half will come in with a cup of tea and you'll get distracted and then you'll forget about it and come back to it and it'll be all over the place So the colour we're using today is fine grey and it's, it's, it would look great on end scale and it would also look even better with TT. Now we'll just tidy that up. And it's starting to really take shape. It's actually looking good. I'm quite happy with this. Alright, so I'm just shuffling it into the side. Now, like I said, nothing is really quite perfect, even though you might be employing the world's best 1 to 20 scale uh, railway civic engineers to work on your layout. You don't need to have that edge there, doesn't need that edge there, doesn't need to be perfect. So, don't feel like it has to be pencil straight. It can be within reason. And, like I said, if you look at books and reference material, with its magazines on YouTube, you'll know what I mean. Yeah. Technical failure. And as I'm moving along here, I'm just angling it in there a little bit. Just, just in there. Because once that glue sets, it'll lock that ballast in there and I would probably rather not have it that close on the inside. Now we'll come back to that later. A little bit more adjustment. With balancing too, I'd probably only tend to do small sections at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself. Just do what you can manage. And I might bring that in a bit more. Like I said at the start, you don't have to do this. If you just want to lay track down and you feel this is all too much, do so. But I really think if you're going to that level and you bought it, a TT set. You'll do the, the whole set and the rolling stock of justice by having really good track work. Or good looking track I should say. And the golden rule here too is if you can get it looking good, don't fiddle with it. <laughs>
that nice sharp edge there really does help on this thing. Like I said, it doesn't have to be pencil sharp, like that's your ballast, but within reason. And just a little, you want the sleepers in my eye. To my eye, I think it looks correct if you were just to have the tops of the sleepers shining through. And there you go, it also emphasizes the fact that you went to all that effort to paint them. Weather them. And I'm just, again, just doing that final dig out on the inside there. Yeah. Now, when it comes to balancing points, special care needs to be taken. Again, get a paintbrush and just make sure you don't get stuff in here. Just flick it out. This is the only time you really have to slow down with your ballasting is just be careful because you don't want ballast in that little bit there. So keep a little paintbrush like this handy on standby just to clean out anything in that, in that contact zone as we're going to call it. Yeah, flick it around. Okay. Yeah, because if you get a bit of ballast in there, again, that may not come across properly. And conductivity may not be there. And you might have derailments. All sorts of issues. Right. So to me, that looks, that looks all right. Now for the putting down of the ballast. Oh, gluing it down. Now there's a couple ways you can go about this. You could either use something like uh, Woodland Scenics, Scenics Cement S191. Now this is a proven product. Now the beauty of this is you can, it's ready mixed. It's a concentrated special PVA, which has got additives in it, which gives it actual tack factor and makes it it's just the right consistency for holding down ballast and this actually I believe is a, is a form of crushed up colored walnut so it will have a tendency to float a little bit it's not actually crushed stone even though for all the world it looks like crushed stone it's not so that is a fantastic it's got a, like I said it's got extra resins and additives which actually to help stop it from floating around and really locks it down or the other alternative is, is just to get uh, PBA this is the magic mix 50% PVA 50% water mix it up mix it up into a, a white uh, gooey emulsion and a few drops of dishwashing liquid which kills the surface tension and you can either use a dropper or you can use a spray bottle and you just soak it but for today's demonstration we'll do the soaking with a spray bottle now you probably want to just initially just give it a couple light squirts like that. It will move around a bit because you'll have that pressure from it being, being blown around a little bit. But as it dampens down, it'll start locking in place. Now as you're doing this, it'll change colour. That's perfectly fine. And you really, really want to soak it. Now, if you are going to mix up your own mixture, the 50% PVA would glue the 50% water, but it the point of using detergent also helps it soak soak through so you want the water to pull that glue through so you're really going to have to soak it down now things to consider sometimes if your timber is thin you might actually apply that much of uh, the emulsion and it'll be the water that may could warp your timber a little bit and just by doing that that would be so, the same sort of effect you would get with a dropper almost just like getting a, a drop of it and just 
letting it soak in, letting it run through. And so that's gone really well. We haven't actually had it shift around too much or bubble up. Or so, okay, so apart from the fact that I've really created a bit of a mess here, and it looks awful at this stage, that's fine. Now, the next step is walk away. Just walk away. Don't touch it, don't start fiddling with it, don't start poking it, don't try, just walk away because you, what you'll indefinitely end up probably doing is you'll probably put your thumb into it. You'll end up knocking it around, so just leave it alone, walk away. Ideally, I would probably say overnight or maybe even two days. Uh, depending on the time of year, you might be in a cold shed uh, if you can. Um, just let it, let it sit. So there you go. That's episode two. We're done balancing. So we're on our way to building a layout. All right. So that's it for this stage. Uh, hopefully I'll see you for part three. All right. In the meantime, have fun with it. It's a hobby. See you later. Bye.